thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, my primary home is in mechanical engineering, but I feel like this department is sort of my spiritual home. All my best collaborators are here, um, including Larry from, from day one. So um, it's great to be here. So I'll be talking about our work, uh, 3D pathology. Uh, just as a preview, um, we work on other types of microscopy as well. In the past, we've worked on endoscopic molecular imaging technologies as well. Uh, in the early days, we developed a, a lot of miniature microscopes, endoscopic and handheld, for early detection and surgical guidance. We've had projects on brain tumor resection, oral cancer early detection. Uh, I won't talk about that work today. I'll focus on our 3D pathology work, primarily looking at biopsies and surgical specimens for clinical decision support. I'll touch on uh, a new project, a very big new project, uh, that's about to get funded by ARPA-H on intraoperative guidance as well. Uh, these are the required disclosure statements. I have no um, financial relationships with companies that are focusing on clinical assays. However, I do have um, a, a company that we started focused on uh, research uh, services and hardware for pharma companies and researchers. This was started with a uh, former postdoc in my lab, Adam Glazer, very talented engineer. And then Nick, uh, the story was when I first arrived at UW in 2014, this was uh, August of 2014, I got an email that, that very first week from Nick. Um, he was excited about, I somehow found my you know, website, and he was very excited to, to work together. Uh, that first conversation looked nothing like what I'm gonna present, but the important thing is we had that conversation, he introduced me to Larry, and that led to hundreds of other conversations that brought us to where we are today. And of course, Nick is now the CEO of this company, um, and so it's, it's been a great ride. It's a, a great model for how engineers and clinicians can work well together and that's something special about this place at uh, University of Washington, I would say. So naturally, Nick and Larry are GU pathologists, so a lot of our early work has focused on prostate cancer. So this is definitely preaching to the choir, but um, uh, I thought it'd be good to remind ourselves of what we already know, which is that uh, men of a certain age, we should get our PSA levels checked. Uh, there was just an article showing that for African-American men, they're now they're recommending maybe 40 years is, <laughs> 40 years old is where they should start. Um, but in any case, if these levels are elevated or if there's symptoms of prostate cancer, uh, we should be referred to a urologist who will take at least a dozen core needle biopsies, one millimeter diameter, section them, stain on H&E. And if there's a presence of cancer, of course, most prostate cancers are indolent, they won't lead to death, but we need to identify the small fraction that could be lethal. And so Gleason grading, developed by Don Gleason over 50 years ago, is the way that we do that. As a reminder, that's based entirely on looking at the glandular architecture of um, the seminal vesicles in this case. And uh, this is subjective. Uh, this is um, not a perfect quantitative art, of course. And so there's often inter-observer disagreements. And small disagreements, for example, if one pathologist only sees Gleason pattern three uh, versus another who might see a little bit of pattern four, that could lead to dramatically different treatment recommendations. In the case of three plus three or uh, grade group one, uh, you would usually recommend active surveillance, which maintains that high quality of life. But of course, if you got this wrong, maybe this would metastasize um, and lead to death. Uh, for Gleason three plus four or grade group two, uh, usually it's surgery or radiation therapy. You reduce that risk of metastasis, but of course these could have potentially serious side effects, incontinence, impotence. So of the, over the 250,000 men diagnosed with prostate cancer each year in the US, about half of them lie right in this pattern three, pattern four regime. So in summary, Gleason grading is not always reliable. It's actually quite good, but it's not always reliable for, for certain patients for distinguishing between lethal and indolent cancer. And it's not just when the pathologists disagree, of course. Even if they agree, this is a, a guide and it's not exact. So one reason for that is the way pathology is done. Um, as a reminder, it's a destructive process or cutting through the biopsy. We like to maintain as much sample as possible for downstream assays. We're looking at maybe 1% of that biopsy at best in 2D. And of course we live in a 3D world so we'd like to be able to see more um, in 3D. Of course now there's digital whole slide imaging, but that adds another step of scanning the slide. You still have to do all of these procedures with inherent disadvantages. Uh, you're adding a little more time and money so that you can apply AI to those images. So alternatively, if we can 
fix and clear the tissues to make them transparent and label them with fluorescent analogs of some of these pathology stains um, or antibodies and image it in a high throughput fashion. This will be entirely non-destructive. We would maintain all of that specimen for downstream assays. We would image 100% of the biopsy in this case in 3D. And on top of that, our clearing approaches are essentially a series of uh, reagent exchanges. Very easily automated, it's non-destructive, so there's no grossing involved, there's no sectioning involved. So potentially much cheaper and fully automated. So of course we, we need to ask, well, what would be the potential value of 3D versus 2D? Um, for better or for worse, pathologists right now live in a 2D world, so the question is always, you know, how would 3D help? And so of course with prostate, we, we talked about the glands are this convoluted branching tree network. There's other examples, tumor vasculature, kidney tubules, where being able to see things in 3D would be less ambiguous, and we'll give examples of that later. There's complex distributions of cells. The best example would be the tumor immune microenvironment. We all know that the spatial relationships are important between immune cells and tumor cells. It can be predictive of treatment response to checkpoint inhibitors or CAR T cell therapies. But these uh, microenvironments are highly heterogeneous. And so it depends on where you look. Oftentimes you want to be at that peritumoral infiltrating edge to see if the lymphocytes are getting in, for example, to really uh, know what's going on. And then finally, sparse or rare objects, things like lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion. We, we, will see, we know these things are out there. Sometimes we miss them on 2D sections. In 3D, if we can image orders of magnitude more tissue and use AI to find these rare events, hopefully we can have better quantification of these um, rare objects and be able to guide treatments more effectively. So we use light sheet microscopy. So unlike sort of the traditional workhorse 3D microscopy techniques like confocal or two photon, we're not focusing to a sharp spot and scanning it in a raster pattern. Here we're doing camera-based imaging, which is very fast. So instead of cutting the tissue into a thin tissue section, we're illuminating the tissue, usually from the side with a thin sheet of light and then generating fluorescence that's imaged just like you would image a glass slide orthogonally onto a very high speed sensitive SCMOS camera, scientific CMOS camera. So it's a pretty uh, simple concept. Uh, the caveat is you need the tissue to be relatively transparent to get the light in and out. Uh, but if you can do that, in the early days they were looking at transparent organisms like, like embryos, zebrafish and drosophila. Uh, this is a very fast 3D microscopy technique and it's very gentle in the sense that you, you're only illuminating the part of the tissue that you want to image. So unlike confocal where you're bathing the tissue with a ton of light and using a pinhole to reject most of the light, here uh, you're, you're making full use of that illumin illumination, reducing phototoxicity, reducing photo bleaching. Now the challenge is the early mi uh, light sheet microscope systems were not designed for clinical applications. They had severe geometric constraints, tedious sample prep, Oftentimes you had to embed things in agaros, put them in cuvettes or capillary tubes. So the sample prep often took longer than the imaging itself. In the early days, in conversations with Nick and Larry, we decided it would be great to have something as easy to use as a flatbed document scanner for tissues. So here we've placed all of the optics underneath the sample. It's a modular sample holder, so it could be as simple as a glass plate or a multi-well plate or a custom biopsy holder. We're coming in at 45 degrees here with our light sheet, imaging orthogonally onto our fast camera. A lot of the innovation and challenge is getting the light in at such a sharp angle as you're focusing without being severely aberrated. Like as you're going from one index into another with a, se a severe jump. So from air into glass into tissue. Um, so in our first system, we had this concept of using a solid immersion lens. Uh, that performance will be called wavefront matching. Essentially, if the center of curvature of that hemisphere is coincident with the focus of your beams, then all of the light is traveling in the normal direction, at a zero degree angle of incidence as it goes from air into the glass. If that's true, you don't have refraction. Everything just passes straight through and you're able to mitigate those, those aberrations. Um, once the light's in the glass, then we rely on index matching. So we have this thin layer of oil with the same index as the glass. The sample holder should be the same material as the solid immersion lens and the tissue should ideally be cleared with the same index. Then the light passes through without, without any problem. This is a stage scan system. So the, the light sheet is stationary in space. Uh, all the optical paths are stationary. We move the sample 
through the light sheet to create a volume over time. So for example, if we move this specimen from left to right, we're collecting a series of these 45 degree angled images over time that gives us this thin volumetric brick of data. And if we scan adjacent bricks, then we can scan large volumes over time. So again, the open top gives us that ease of use um, and the light sheet provides the speed for large specimens. Uh, this is a video of our first generation system. Um, looks a little bit different now, but the scanning is, is still the same. This is sped up quite a bit by 16 fold. But every time you have one pass, you're collecting that thin volumetric brick and you're scanning adjacent bricks to, to scan a large volume over time. Now one of the challenges with the first system is we had this solid piece of glass that prevented us from lowering the specimen to image deeper in. Um, so all subsequent systems, we have this immersion bath now, where now the sample holder can be lowered. If we lower it, then we can image deeper and deeper into the, into the specimen. Um, so in this case, we have still a solid immersion lens concept uh, for wavefront matching on the illumination. We're using an immersion objective here dipped into that oil bath. And again, yeah, we're scanning these bricks of data, scanning adjacent bricks laterally and vertically to scan a large volume. Uh, the index matching is critical as we increase the numerical aperture, which is the focusing power of the system. It becomes more and more critical to make sure your sample, your sample holder, and your immersion bath all have very similar indices of refraction to avoid any aberrations at these interfaces. With our third system, we had our first multi-resolution system. So just like a pathology uh, microscope has a turret of objectives, in 3D that's even more important because data set sizes, imaging times scale to the third power with 3D microscopy. So here we had a, a couple of air objectives on a turret. We're using this solid immersion meniscus lens concept that pr uh, provides wavefront matching on both interfaces, a slight tweak on our, pro our previous um, design. But otherwise, very similar. Light's coming in at 45 degrees, coming out at, at 45 degrees as well. One challenge is, uh, as we go to higher and higher NA, you know, these objectives have fairly limited working distances. And especially if you're angling them at 45 degrees, you limit how deep you can image before the sample holder hits the bevel here. Um, so that was one challenge. The other was that, again, as I mentioned, as we increase the magnification and the numerical aperture of these objectives, the index matching became more and more challenging. Um, and so um, that became something that reduced the ease of use, I would say. So finally, with our fourth generation system, you can see we don't have that orthogonal path between illumination and collection anymore. We have this 45 degree angle. The nice thing about having this vertically oriented collection objective is now we're imaging orthogonal to the sample holder. So that gets rid of all of the off-axis aberrations that were really hurting us in, in the past designs. So this system ended up being much more tolerant of index mismatch, much more easy to use. We didn't have to match the sample holder and the specimen in terms of index of refraction. Also, uh, we can now utilize the full working distance of this objective. We can lower the specimen by up to one centimeter in this case to image, for example, whole mouse brain uh, was, was some examples that we showed. There's also room to put another collection arm. So this is a hybrid system with a low resolution path on the outside and then a high resolution path on the inside. Uh, so two systems really combined in one. And to make the, the high resolution path work, what we do is we create a re, uh, remote focus. It's basically a one-to-one -one replica of the light sheet from the sample to this remote focus point here. And then we can come in with an, uh, an angled camera arm to image that light sheet in the correct orthogonal dimension. So with four systems, we've traded off uh, in, in terms of lateral resolution, for anywhere from half a micron up to 10 microns if you want to do mesoscopic, fast mesoscopic imaging. Our last two systems have been multi-resolution. Now we have a system that has a very large imaging depth of up to one centimeter. And it's also the most tolerant to index mismatch. So it's now our workhorse system. It's very easy to use. Um, has a long working distance, has uh, nice uh, different resolution set points. So uh, before I show some data, I'll just mention a little bit about tissue clearing. You know, there's hundreds of protocols out there. A lot of people use this relatively simple iDisco protocol. It's, it's very simple, it's just dehydration based. Turns out water is the biggest culprit, it has a pretty low index of 1.33. So if we dehydrate the tissue with ethanol, 
remove the water and replace it with a high index oil. This is a food grade cinnamon oil, ethyl cinnamate, uh, very safe, 1.56 index. That matches the index of the proteins and lipids pretty well. Most tissues become quite clear after doing that, and we can image up to half a millimeter um, deep for most tissues. If you want to image deeper, or there's certain tissues that are a little more difficult, like human lymph nodes we've had challenges with, or if you're looking at fluorescent proteins in animal models that are um, going to be quenched by the dehydration process, or certain antibodies don't like being in ethanol, then cubic is another alternative that we've used. It's an aqueous protocol. They use detergents to remove some of the lipids. Um, but this is a very advanced and very nice protocol that works well as well. Uh, a lot of our images look like H&E, and that's, of course, intentional. That's what pathologists are used to seeing. So in the early days, we wanted to make sure our image quality could pass muster with the, the pathologist. Um, we use a fluorescent analog. There are a variety of nuclear fluorophores that can replace hematoxylin, and eosin happens to fluoresce already, so we can just use eosin as is. I should mention our, our cameras are all black and white cameras. They're grayscale cameras. We have fluorescence filters. And so all of the, the coloring is done in software. People can use deep learning for that, um, but there's always the question of hallucinations. We use a, a physics-based model to replicate the Beer-Lambert law absorption of light. And so there's a very deterministic, no hallucinations. Uh, so when we can get away with it, we always use the, the physics-based methods. And of course, um, there's other small molecule stains, like in Josh Vaughn's lab in chemistry, they've, they've developed something like periodic acid shift trichrome for uh, renal pathology specimens. It works quite well. So here's an image many of you have seen before, core needle biopsy uh, of prostate, one millimeter diameter. We've mounted about a dozen biopsies here into one Hyvex, Hyvex is an eyeglass lens material that we can machine, has the right index to match the cinnamon oil. Uh, here you can see that this is benign prostate. It's got that bilayer of epithelial cells, nice mature branching tree network um, of glands. For prostate cancer, uh, one of the challenges uh, that all GU pathologists face is distinguishing between poorly formed glands, one of the variants of Gleason pattern four, and a tangential section of a fully formed gland. So if you cut a fully formed gland at the edge tangentially, it might look poorly formed. That's been an ongoing challenge. Uh, so here's just an anecdote showing how if you look at different depths, you can see that this collection of epithelial cells is really a tangential section of a fully formed gland. And this could be, again, the difference between surgery or not sur no surgery for a patient. So um, important uh, ambiguities to address. There's a lot of examples like this. Uh, another one would be tumor buds and colorectal cancer specimens. We've done studies where we show that the majority of objects that look like tumor buds in 2D are actually infiltrating tendrils coming from the main tumor mass They're, that are not actually isolated uh, tumor you know, clusters of cells. So the, a, a lot of examples like that. Um, here's a preclinical example, mouse kidney. Um, many of you have seen this as well. This is prepared by Josh Vaughn's lab with expansion microscopy. So here they embed things in a hydrogel. They digest the way the tissues, the fluorophores remain, and they expand the tissues by fourfold in this case so that we can see higher resolution structures. Um, the, the gray are the nuclei, so we can see a lot of subnuclear features, um, a giant vessel here, and then the glomeruli um, popping in and out occasionally. This is the same data set uh, rendered as a volume. So we see that large vessel with the endothelial cells sort of spiraling. So here's a glomerulus. So um, this is just eye candy, but it's always nice to see this magic school bus ride through the vessel. And probably red blood cells floating here, lacking nuclei, and then maybe white blood cells here, endothelial cells here. So very cool data set. And then one more example would be from our latest multi-resolution system. During the pandemic, um, the inventors of Cubic in Japan shipped us some mouse brains that they prepared and they were studying brain mets. So the first step was to identify the location of the mets. So let's see if we can get this video to play. Oh, there we go. Um, so if we were to image this whole mouse brain at high resolution, it would have taken us probably about a week. Uh, but at low resolution, we could do this in a couple hours. So that was the first step, low res imaging. Once we found the location of the mets, we can zoom in at high res 
to provide um, the detail that they needed to quantify these structures. Um, so this is a, just an example of why a multi-resolution workflow um, is, is really uh, practically necessary and, and helpful. All right, so you know, if we want to get this into the clinic, that's a long-term goal for both my lab and, and the company as well. We have to do the clinical studies to show that 3D has advantages over 2D. Uh, computational analysis has to be a part of that because these data sets are massive on, on the terabyte scale. Uh, so there's two ways to do that. One would be what we call a handcrafted approach. We could segment out the structures that pathologists already trust. For prostate, of course, that's the glands. That's the basis for Gleason grading. We can extract intuitive, explainable features to train a traditional machine classifier. Alternatively, there's the end-to-end the -end deep learning approach um, where you have your data sets on one side, your clinical outcomes on the other. Um, this is potentially much more powerful. You can pull out sub-visual features, uh, but um, it's not very intuitive, of course. This is essentially a black box. So I'll show examples of both. We'll start with the, the handcrafted, um, which should provide some insights for pathologists. So first, we need to segment out the prostate glands in 3D. Uh, there's a few ways to do that. One um, would be relying on a lot of manual annotations. So we like to use our fluorescent analog of H&E because it's a small molecule stain. It diffuses very quickly in tissues within an hour, I would say. Unlike antibodies, that would take weeks in our lab to do thick tissue labeling. Um, but to segment the glands from an image that looks like H&E, ideally we would need pathologists to you know, circle a lot of glands, which is tedious and, and subjective. Um, alternatively, we can immunolabel with cytokeratin markers the epithelial cells, um, the luminal epithelial cells that are in all prostate glands. And then um, we can use traditional thresholding, other computer vision-based techniques to segment out the glands. But this is very time consuming and expensive for thick tissues, and so we prefer not to do that very often. Um, so we came up with this pipeline which sort of merges the two. We start with our H&E analog and we create essentially a deep fake, a synthetic immunofluorescence image. But this is actually fully supervised, very accurate, uh, because we trained it uh, with tissues that were triple labeled with our H&E analog plus the targeted antibody of interest. So with pixel level uh, supervision, we can train the model uh, to do this task of identifying the epithelial cells, the synthetic cytokeratin-8 stain. And then we can use our traditional computer vision thresholding techniques to create the segmentation mask. So this allows us to start with our low cost rapid stain and in an annotation free objective way create that segmentation mask. So this is what it looks like with our h &E analog the synthetic CK8, and then um, a segmentation mass showing the lumen spaces in red, epithelial spaces in yellow, stroma in gray. Um, so the benign glands, of course, have that mature tree, sort of branching tree, hierarchical uh, appearance with the wavy walls, the papillary infoldings. Cancerous glands, uh, when I teach engineers, I tell them it's kind of like a, a bush, like an immature bush. Lots of small branches, sometimes they fuse, sometimes they cluster together, cribiform. Um, they, they, they lose that papillary infolding waviness, um, so quite different. But the challenge, of course, is knowing which of the pro, uh, cancerous uh, uh, biopsies are actually aggressive prostate cancer. Okay, so yeah, here's a volume uh, rendering just kind of showing what it looks like in 3D. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and so it shows you the richness of the data set. We can pull out the skeleton that kind of goes through the middle of the glands. Um, and so from this, we can extract a bunch of features like curvatures, volume ratios, tortuosity. Um, and so that's what we did in this initial study. We had 50 cases initially. Half of these patients had a biochemical recurrence within five years of surgery. Half of these patients didn't. So that's our high risk group, low risk group. We pulled simulated biopsies from the prostatectomy specimens, did our H&E analog staining, tissue clearing, 3D microscopy, gland segmentation, and then what we wanted to do is to compare 3D glandular features versus analogous 2D features. So if we looked at volume ratios in 3D, we would look at area ratios in 2D, volumetric curvature versus volumetric curvature in 2D, um, and correlate those features with the five-year BCR outcomes of these patients. Here's just a couple examples. Uh, this is lumen curvature. So we have uh, the BCR represents the high-risk cases that had BCR within five years, non-BCR is a low risk. 
So it makes sense to us that the high-risk patients have more curvature because the glands tend to be smaller and therefore more curved. Gland to convex hollow ratio has to do with the waviness of the walls. So here we would expect the cancerous, um, the, higher, uh, the more aggressive cancers to have less waviness, whereas the more benign glands have that, those papillary infoldings. So all of this sort of makes intuitive sense, which is nice. What's important is that the 3D version of the feature outperforms the 2D version. Um, and if we combine about a dozen features, that's where we really see the difference that this, this multi-parameter model based on 3D features is better than the 2D. And with this KM analysis, for some of these cases, we had time to BCR. Time zero is the surgery date. So over the course of five or six years after surgery, if we use our best 2D model to try to stratify, we don't see good separation. But with the best 3D model, we see very good separation between high risk and low risk with a hazard ratio of 11. So very preliminary study, but uh, promising. Uh, we then did, um, with Faisal Mahmoud at the Brigham and Women's, uh, more of a weekly supervised end-to-end -end deep learning approach. And just as a reminder, with the handcrafted approach we talked about before, we have intuitive features that provide intuitive insights. Uh, with the deep learning approach, where it's much more comprehensive, we can pull out all kinds of sub-visual features, but unfortunately not easy to interpret. Um, this is a busy slide, but really it boils down to three steps. First, we have to break our biopsy into chunks to fit within the GPU memory. Then we have to embed each chunk into a, a low dimensional feature vector. Basically, we're encoding it um, into a low dimensional vector. This is done with a variety of pre-trained models. There's no foundation model for 3D pathology yet. So we used uh, video models where we treat the time axis as the third depth axis or radiology models that exist in 3D. Turns out the video models work better, uh, I think because the radiology models have too low resolution to really be effective at pulling out nice features. Then we aggregate all those chunks to create one feature vector that describes the whole biopsy, and then we train things so that we can predict the label, which is the BCR outcomes in this case. This is a, a pretty long paper, but it really boils down, I think, to this one plot, very simple plot where if we want to look at classification performance based on the original prostatectomy uh, Gleason grade, uh, it's pretty good, over 0.75 AUC. But if we look at 2D AI applied to a few 2D levels within the biopsy, three levels per biopsy replicating standard of care, we get better performance. Of course, if we apply 2D AI to all of the levels within the biopsy, comprehensively looking at 3D, uh, that gives you even better performance uh, but if we extract 3D features, these are volumetric features that are impossible to extract from a 2D image, that gives the best. Um, so it's not just a matter of imaging more tissue, it's also being able to extract those 3D features that gives you ultimately the best performance. And for these small biopsies, the more tissue, the better, is, is what we found. Then we did a human observer study uh, with six pathologists from around the globe. Um, two in, in North America, one in Canada, a couple in the UK, um, and then one in Spain, I believe. And so if we train a classifier based on the individual pathologists, it, it varies. Here's the consensus of the six pathologists, and then the tripath 3D pathology algorithm outperforms all of them, which is nice to see. All right, so kind of taking a step back, if we look at the roadmap for clinical adoption, we we'll first have to generate the data either through an external reference lab, um, or it turns out you know, a lot of people want in-house equipment now. Um, there's a device in the Mayo Clinic, for example. There's one at a, a CLIA lab in Puerto Rico. Um, but hopefully you know, these, these technologies will get out there. Then it's a matter of interpretation. That's, the, that's probably the most challenging part, I would say. Uh, of course, the lowest risk is to have the pathologist interpret 3D data. That might work for certain use cases, but it's just not practically feasible in most cases because of the size of the data. We talked about the fully computational approach, which hopefully eventually will roll out for oncologists, much like an LDT uh, genomics assay where people can ship biopsies and get a, a risk report, a, a risk score. Um, but in the medium risk uh, category, what we think would be very useful would be AI to guide the pathologist, keeping the pathologist in the loop to provide the final diagnosis, but really using AI just to extract the best levels for the pathologist to view. This can be no worse than standard of care, which is sort of random. You're just cutting three random levels from every biopsy. Um, this has to be better if we can actually use AI to find the best levels. 
And then finally, uh, we don't want 3D pathology to live in isolation. It has to really be combined with the best of all of the omics techniques to provide decision support. So let me just give a quick example of the uh, medium risk AI triage. We did this for Barrett's esophagus. This is uh, with help from Deep Tea Ready and Bill Grady at the, at the Hutch. Um, so you guys know all about Barrett's esophagus, random biopsies to screen for dysplasia and um, EAC. Um, so right now, of course, destructive sectioning, limited sampling of the biopsies. We want to be able to image the whole biopsy and provide comprehensive sampling. But of course, these data sets are massive. We don't want pathologists to have to look through hundreds and thousands of levels, essentially. And so we developed this pipeline to first create a 3D map of neoplastic risk uh, trained with a ResNet, and then to extract out the best levels, the highest risk levels to show to the pathologist using a random forest classifier. Um, the ResNet was trained with uh, tedious pixel-based annotation in this case provided by DeepT, um, and then the RFC, the random forest was uh, trained with image-based annotations. Both of them had pretty good AUCs, at least for a triage technique. And so we wanted to do a very preliminary proof of concept with 20 unseen biopsies. Uh, right now at UW, it seems pretty aggressive. They, they look at 16 levels per biopsy, a lot of work for, for DT. Um, with AI triage, we pulled out the three best levels per biopsy. We're imaging the whole biopsy, but just pulling out the three best levels. And of those 20 biopsies with conventional slide-based pathology, uh, DeepT only found one case with neoplasia. Uh, with our technique, she found four. So at least you know, for this very uh, preliminary study, it seemed quite promising. And so in summary, we could potentially use AI-assisted 3D pathology, keeping the pathologist in the loop to improve accuracy and sensitivity while simultaneously reducing pathologist workloads. So that's kind of that win-win value prop that hopefully can drive adoption. So if we look at 3D pathology, it's really a, a collection of technologies from sample prep to imaging to analysis. On the sample prep side, there's, there's a lot of different directions we're trying to pursue, trying to automate things better, um, perform better QC. We have a, a, a paper, a Nature Protocols this year, where we describe some of our techniques right now in the lab to do some of this. Uh, of course, there's a lot of interest in spatial biology, of course. And the obvious thing is to try to go 3D. Um, and so we have a few projects on that, one with the Allen Institute, one with our collaborators at the Brigham and, and Women's uh, to try to do 3D multiplex immunolabeling or RNA fish. And finally, um, just starting a project uh, with Colin Pritchard, Eric Connick, uh, Michael Hoffner, and Larry, of course, uh, 3D guided macro dissection, um, where the goal is to show that if we can image the full biopsy, or in this case, it would be a surgical specimen, a bread loaf, find the best regions to um, extract with a, with a biopsy punch and to trim. Uh, hopefully, we'll have more tissue volume and more purity in the end to improve sequencing compared to current 2D macro dissection approaches. So that's something we want to show. On the imaging side, the biologists always want more resolution. So um, again, in collaboration with the Allen Institute, we're building a system that pushes the resolution. We also want to go deeper, um, starting to, everything we talked about so far has been on fixed tissues that are cleared. There is some interest in organoids um, and uh, organ on chip with Nancy Alberton, um, the Dean of the College of Engineering. And so we're trying to find ways to be able to image in these fresh tissues that are scattering and aberrating. Um, and so that's challenging, of course, to image in fresh tissues. And then I'll mention, uh, uh, before I end, the surgical guidance project uh, briefly, it looks like. I still have time, good. And of course, there's a lot of opportunities on the computational analysis side. We mentioned prostate glands. We've also looked at nuclear um, morphologies uh, in a paper that was published last year. Now we're looking at vessels and nerves, uh, macrophages. So hopefully we can create segmentation masks of many structures and create you know, more holistic classifiers based on all of those structures. And in the meantime, we're also working to push the, the deep learning approach, the, the sort of black box deep learning, hopefully creating 3D foundation models, you know, improving feature extraction, um, improving the performance of those techniques. And finally, integrating AI into the imaging. And that's really where, what we have to do for surgical guidance, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, and finally, we need compelling use cases, of course, to show that all this matters. 
Uh, of course, we've done a lot of work in prostate. Uh, we have a, a grant that was just funded a few weeks ago in esophagus with Bill Grady. Um, kidney, a part of the O'Brien Center where we're working with people at in IU um, in Indiana. Um, and we're doing some work for the, soon um, in surgical guidance for breast and head and neck. And a variety of other pilot projects that are um, not funded, but hopefully, um, yeah, there's, there's many directions we can go. So if anybody has good ideas, please talk to me. Uh, okay, so ARPA-H, this was a new program that was launched last summer. Uh, there was a program director at NCI that moved to ARPA-H. She emailed her portfolio and said, hey, you know, I'm trying to start this program. If you have good ideas, let me know. Uh, we set up a Zoom call um, back last June, about a, about a year ago. Uh, the good thing is she reached back over the course of the summer several times to myself, uh, to Susie, to Sarah Javid, the surgeon, uh, Susie Dinsis. Um, so we could tell she was interested. And sure enough, the, the funding announcement came out in August. And it mentioned our technology. The specifications matched our microscope perfectly. Um, so we were like, OK, now we have to apply. Um, it's definitely the most excruciating proposal I've ever put together, if anyone's gone through this. Um, uh, I'm, I'm glad it got funded, because otherwise it would have been <laughs> enormous time sink. Um, but what we're trying to do is um, develop end-to-end -end solutions, devices, and software for intraoperative imaging of resected specimens. Uh, they want multiple clinical sites and multiple organs. We're going to do breast here, head and neck at Vanderbilt. Um, and it has to be fully automated is what they want. So as a reminder, you know, this is the way surgical pathology is done now to guide and whether it's frozen sections or post-op, it's, it's vertical sectioning. And we're looking at a few sections at three to five millimeter intervals because of the bread loafing procedure. The nice thing about that is it gives us depth information so we can see how close the tumor is to the margin surface. And that's the basis for a lot of these um, criteria, the close margin criteria. Maybe it's um, like five centimeters for head and neck. <clears throat> the disadvantage is you're, you're looking at a very limited, less than 1% of the actual margin, the, the actual inked margin surface. Alternatively, if we could image the entire inked margin surface with microscopic resolution, that would be fully comprehensive. The disadvantage is it would have to be superficial because it's fresh tissue. We cannot image that deep, maybe 100 microns at best. But the hypothesis, which we hope to show is true in future studies, is that comprehensive imaging of that margin surface, showing that there's no tumor on ink, is superior than the sparse vertical sectioning procedure for most solid tumors. Um, assuming that most solid tumors are not multifocal, they may infiltrate, they may travel along the ducts, for example, for DCIS. But as long as we have cellular resolution, we're comprehensively imaging at that inked margin surface, we hope that this would be the better way to do things. And it re requires no grossing of the specimen. So there's some advantages in terms of clinical workflow can be done um, quickly in the operating room, hopefully. So with light chain microscopy, the question is why would that help if we just want to image the tissue surface? Uh, with a conventional microscope, you have a very shallow depth of focus if you want high resolution. These are surgically excised specimens with very irregular tissue surfaces at the microscopic level. So that surface would come in and out of focus. With a volumetric microscopy, we can collect the 3D volume and then digitally extract the surface from that volume. And so that's what we've showed in the past. Um, with, with one cut, you would miss a lot of the tissue. If we do surface digital surface extraction, we can give a more comprehensive map. So here's just a video showing before and after surface extraction. This is a head and neck specimen. We can false color. This was taken with our older generation microscope, so it's not super high resolution. Um, but you can certainly see uh, down here, there should be a region of head and neck cancer, some disrupted architecture, some nuclear atypia. Um, so th this was a feasibility study showing that, that we can do the comprehensive imaging. And of course, we're going to improve the resolution and make things better. This is what uh, the overall workflow should look like. We have the specimen excise. We'll put our device in the operating room. The first step is to create a macroscopic 3D model, sort of like a CAD model of the specimen. Uh, that's important so that later we can um, show the surgeon where to cut. Once we do that with a modular sample holder, we'd place the same sample holder right on top of our system, scan it from below. If there's different faces the surgeon's concerned about, we can flip the specimen and image a few faces. Uh, this would all be done at low resolution, because um, ARPA-H wants us to be able to image 
uh, specimens as large as 10 by 10 centimeters within 15 minutes of resection. And the only way you can do that is starting at low resolution, we're thinking two to four micron resolution. And then, and then we want to train an AI algorithm to identify the highest risk regions. We'd go back at high resolution, generate the images that can either be interpreted by a pathologist or another AI algorithm. And then we need to correlate back into that macroscopic model. The original plan was to use AR to allow the surgeon to visualize the specimen back on the patient so they know exactly where to cut, where the positive margin is. Uh, we have since cut that out. Um, they wanted to trim costs. The original proposal was 30, 32 million, now it's down to 21 million. Still a lot of money, but um, they, they trimmed some parts that they thought were too aggressive. So here's the team. Um, we're leading the microscopy part. The breast uh, validation will be done here with Sarah Javitt, Emily Palmquist, um, and Susie on the pathology side. Uh, we have the Vanderbilt team. Eben and Michael are the head and neck lead head and, head and neck surgeons there. Um, our AI team at the Brigham and Women's. And then the company is involved. This is the first project where we actually will involve Alpenglow. Um, once we prototype things in the lab, they're responsible for building the system that will be put in the multiple clinical sites. Um, so it's an exciting project that should start in August. Um, another uh, big program we're putting together right now uh, that I'm leading with Bill Grady is for gastric cancer. And uh, here we want to provide uh, screening, early detection, risk stratification. Gastric cancers, of course, uh, disproportionately affect minority populations. We're going to start with Southeast Asian populations and then hopefully move to Alaska Native peoples later. Uh, this is a technology-focused project. The first project would be wide population screening using gastric brushings, ideally non-endoscopic brushings, where uh, Bill will be developing assays based on DNA methylation. Then for the highest risk patients, we want to do hyperspectral endoscopy. This is Nick Durr at Hopkins in the biomedical engineering department, um, where we can target the biopsies to the, the most high risk regions of the stomach. Once we have those biopsies, then we would come in with 3D pathology for the final risk stratification. Um, one of the things that's exciting about this is we, we propose this core. We're hoping to submit this whole grant in September. Uh, September 25th is the deadline. Uh, but this is, if this is funded, it will help us to set up um, an initial 3D pathology and analysis core that would service this program, but then eventually hopefully service the university, the region. Uh, this is something that we've been trying to do for a while um, and, and have chatted with Jeff about. So hopefully this will provide some um, seed funding for that. So finally, let me end with this final slide. I teach biodesign, engineering, and innovation and health uh, in, uh, in, in the College of Engineering. And so we always tell our students to, to remember who your customers are and your competitors. So we already talked about surgeons being one potential customer. Uh, the competition is frozen sectioning, uh, not a great technique. Limited sampling, you know, not great image quality. So I think a lot of people realize there's an opportunity. It's a very competitive field, lots of companies working on this. And, and the ARPA-H, of course, is investing in, in a number of teams, not just us. Um, and so we hope to show that um, our, our technique can be better, faster. Um, for oncologists, I think one of the big competitors are these genomics assays. These are destructive. Uh, I was told that a decipher assay takes about half a biopsy worth of material and de destroys that. Um, it's also expensive, about three to $5,000 per biopsy is, is what I've been told. Um, so computational 3D pathology is entirely non-destructive, potentially very inexpensive and something that can be automated. And then pathologists, honestly, are probably our, our toughest customer, I would say because of how entrenched side-based pathology is now. Um, but you know, if we recognize that there are limitations, um, limited sampling, the tedium of pro both producing the slides and interpreting them, maybe something like AI triaged 3D pathology uh, could provide enough value that we can start to get, get it out into the hands of clinicians like you. Um, so with that, let me just uh, end and, and acknowledge uh, the team. Adam is now at the, uh, at the Allen Institute, but he was an amazing engineering postdoc who came just around the time we were starting to talk with Nick Reeder and Larry. So it's just a perfect convergence of engineers and, and clinicians that hopefully we can keep replicating. Um, here we have our uh, pathologists that we work with. Uh, we're missing some names here. Uh, now Colin Pritchard, Eric Connick on the 3D macro dissection. Done some work with Charlie, of course. So. Um, Sorry, sorry if I missed some names. 
uh, Emory University, Anant Madhubushi is helping with the handcrafted approaches. Faisal is the, um, the big name now for deep learning computational pathology. Um, working with Bill Grady, of course, on GI. Michael Hoffner is helping with the prostate at the Hutch. And I'm working with a team through Prostate Cancer UK on prostate cancer. Um, and so that's led by Freddie Hamdi, urologist, and Ian is a researcher uh, who many of you have probably met. So with that, um, let me just thank funding sources, and soon we'll add ARPA-H to this. And thank you for this opportunity to, to present. It says, I imagine the 3D reconstruction takes a while. Oh, this is a question from Corey Simpson, dermatology. Um, but is there future potential to develop a, a live quick scan mode, more like OCT, that could be done in real time to help guide uh, margins for skin cancer excision um, Mo surgery. Uh, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, you know, I think that that whole ARPA-H project should be applicable to most surgeries in the future. Uh, we've talked a lot about Mo's surgeries um, in the past. I, I, I think one thing that's held us back is that in some sense, most surgery has been so successful uh, with frozen sections and these integrated, you know, um, uh, clinical settings where they have the frozen section room right next to the clinics. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit of a tougher field to break into because of how well it's set up in the U.S. at least. Now in Europe and other places, it's not as well set up. And so that's where the, the market for dermatology might be more compelling than in the U.S. But certainly, yeah, um, we, we should be able to do everything we want to do for breast and head and neck, for skin as well, and to help speed up and improve the, the most surgeries. Um, and then there's another question from Yermakov. How do you envision the FDA regulatory ruling uh, on LDTs might factor into implementation? Yeah, that, that's a big question that uh, we don't know. Um, it's good and it's bad. Uh, you know, I, I talked to Nick about this uh, a month ago, and you know, he's he's a positive person, so he, uh, and I, I try to be as well. <laughs> so I think it could be good in the long run. It forces us to get involved with the FDA sooner. It's not necessarily a bad thing. So if we can get approval from the FDA and not just LDT, you know, CLIA certification. Um, in the long run, it, it will take more work in, in, in the short term, but it may be better for our field in the long run. So I don't know, we're all still trying to figure that out. Um, and then finally, a question um, about uh, how it's non-destructive. What can you do with the clear tissue after imaging? Uh, so what we do after we image the tissues is we put it back in the FFPE block, and it's as if nothing has changed. We're doing a bunch of studies now to really prove that. Um, we're going to look at DNA, RNA, housekeeping genes, fish, IHC. Uh, our, our, our goal is to show that nothing we do right now in our standard protocol affects morphology, nucleic acids at all for both prostate and breast. Um, and then later we'll look at other tissues. But yeah, that's important, obviously, to be able to access these archived FFP specimens. Um, and then Erica John Lynn, I wonder if this, if this is not an LDT but a medical device. She's wondering if this is not an LDT but a medical device, um, like if it's used to diagnose, like an MRI machine. Am I speaking with CDRH? Oh, that, that's, those are good questions. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, maybe other people know better. But I was assuming that once the tissue's out of the patient and not like MRI on, on the patient, uh, it's no longer a device. But um, yeah, these are good questions, and yeah, we haven't started talking with um, Centers for Devices and radiolog Radiological Health. So yeah, that's something we have to do next, is, is start to engage with the FDA, I think. So if, if people, yeah. Yes, I was just going to say, yeah, if, if anyone has expertise and ideas, please. I've been interested in looking at that with you because um, it's a diagnostic tool, even, even though you say that it's, yeah, it's outside of the body. It'd be very good to look into now, you know, how it would be, how it would be regulated. Do it, look into it sooner than later. Yep. Yeah, agree. Thank you. Hi, thanks a lot. That was really great. I, I have a couple of questions. The first, more technical, to get at some of the depth issues, is the, are the optics of creating the sheet compatible with two-photon illumination and infrared dyes? Yes. Actually, we just, I just had a conversation uh, with some folks in Europe last week about that, that want to do that in collaboration with us. So I don't see any reason why we couldn't do two-photon illumination. People have done two-photon light sheet 
for sure. Uh, we don't have experience with pulse lasers and such, but I don't think there's any reason we, we can't. Okay, it's just I'm just wondering because you know you, you, you intrinsically essentially get the thin sheet because once you focus it down, you only get the illumination where you have enough photon flux. Right. The two, two, the two photon will help with fresh tissues where they're scattering. Okay. Yeah, and then, that, that's why we're looking into two photon. If we want to look at organoids or organ on chip. Okay, we'll love to talk about that more later. I did a lot of that in graduate school. S second question was, to, to, I think your second to last slide where you just sort of the last thing was, you know, does this just end up being a way to sort of skip through the histology lab to generate what we're already doing, you know, just 2D images. That, that's actually a pretty compelling use case because of what you, you showed, like at the very beginning of this, a lot of these digital things as implemented right now for 2D stuff just adds cost to what we're doing. We still have to do all the histology, and then we have to scan, and then we have to store, and then we have to traffic the images. If we can skip the histology, is that a tractable problem of skipping the histology lab and just going from biopsies to digital images and not no, no glass? That question is above my pay grade, I feel like. Uh, that's that's really for you. Can you technically, in a reasonable amount of time, go from oh. a prostate biopsy yes. to a, a planar image? Absolutely. In, in a time that's competitive with a throughput that's maybe competitive to a, the histo lab? Yes, yeah. F technically, it's completely possible to do this quickly. Uh, we have a paper, Larry, one hour to diagnosis, so we showed that we could take fresh biopsies Within an hour, turn it around to a preliminary diagnosis. We, we couldn't image through the entire biopsy, but we can provide a lot more data than a few tissue sections. So if you want a, a hundred microns of data, we can give you that within a, within an hour of pulling the biopsy out of the patient. So yeah, there's nothing uh, to suggest that we can't do that um, quickly. Yeah. Any other comments? In your uh, know your customers and know your competitors. Um, for like oncologists and pathologists, I mean, I think that one of the key things that I keep thinking about is the need to assay biomarkers and molecular data. And so how do you see the 3D uh, pathology interfacing with really coming up with precise information about biomarkers and molecular data to help yeah. guide precision medicine type to treatment? Yeah, th those are good questions. That's something we're starting to get into uh, with the 3D macro dissection project, for, for instance, where um, we hope to develop a pipeline to show that we can extract more tissue and more pure tissue, that hopefully to enhance you know, what you guys are already doing with 2D slides and scraping you know, um, thin tissue sections. Uh, so yeah, I, it's important that we can fit within the clinical workflows you know, and to provide the genomics information as well as just the morphology. And so um, that's an ongoing discussion. Love to chat more about all the different uh, things that need to be done with the tissue that we have to be compatible with. Um, so yeah, we're starting to get into that. Yeah. I have a technical question, sort of. I mean, one of the problems we run into with conventional pathology is artifacts, and all sorts of technical preparation and things. Are there artifacts that you encounter or introduce with light sheets that you know, need to be considered when we talk about, well, we can be uh, obviate, say, the need for glass yeah. or, or something else. There's artifacts and there's lack of artifacts. So you know, there's some artifacts that you, everyone's used to on 2D sections, retraction artifacts or folds and cracks that we don't see because it's intact tissue. And that may change things for pathologists, right? Um, so that may require a little bit of retraining or something. We, we, I don't think we have major artifacts, although we were talking today about some retraction of glands in the prostate tissues that may have been caused by some of the de-waxing, de hot xylene procedure that we used to remove the wax. Um, yes, but yeah, we, we have to look more into this, and especially to show that after we're done with the FAP block and we return it, we haven't perturbed it in any way. Um, so. You know, there are certainly um, image quality issues we deal with. That was kind of what we published on this year in our Nature Protocols. We have a whole QC pr procedure now for looking at um, the resolution, the, the, the signal to background. As we image deeper and deeper, eventually you do have more scattering. Even with clear tissues, it's not perfectly transparent. So there, there is a depth limit 
So we have to be careful. Um, sometimes the stains don't work well. Um, although we've gotten things to a point over five or six years of refinement that I would say our yield is over 90% now. So um, yeah, it's, it's a small fraction of tissues that for some reason don't look quite right. Whereas in the early days, it was probably flipped. Right? So yeah, we've done a lot to, to refine the, the protocols now. Quick test technical question. Uh, light source. Are you visible light range, infrared, UV? Yeah, right now everything is pretty much in the visible using um, uh, laser, uh, fiber coupled lasers. Uh, yeah, we, we try to look in the near infrared. Those dyes, I think, are a little, you know, the quantum efficiencies are lower, the, the absorption is lower, so they tend to be weaker especially with the detectors that we have, which are not optimized for near-infrared. Um, I think it is doable. We just haven't optimized our systems for near-infrared dyes. And because we're clearing the tissues, we don't have the benefit of the red light being able to penetrate more deeply. But on fresh tissues like organoids, that's where it would matter. Having red light scatters much less and penetrates much more readily into fresh tissues. And so, yeah, we may be re revisiting the red dyes in the future. For the, um, the fresh tissue applications, are those also label-free in terms of? No, oh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, so for the ARPA-H, no. Um, in, in principle, we did propose that to look at autofluorescence. ARPA-H, uh, they're very, um, you know, they manage these things very closely, so they have their own team of te technical people. They said they didn't like that. Uh, they want to stick with what we published in the past, which is to use a single stain, acridine orange. It's fast-acting nuclear stain. But it has a little bit of a background that if we threshold things correctly, the, the low level background is the eosin channel. The bright nuclei is the hematoxylin channel. So we show we can create, uh, create an h &E like appearance with just that one stain. Um, and they, they said they prefer that because it's proven in our publication. Um, but we're doing some additional tests to, to see. Actually, they, they said, can you also try a two stain technique, which would take twice as long. So I don't think it's something we want to do. Uh, but yeah, that's what we're. Um, pursuing right now. Okay, time's up. Um, thanks everyone and as uh, John and I were talking about, he's always receptive to uh, And I'll be at the I'll be at the faculty meeting at the Graduate Hotel if anyone wants to chat more. Complete the evaluation and you get CV credit. Oh, sorry, yes, yes. Okay, thank you.